Hi there, it's Ron Gulat with another episode of the Gula Tech Cyber Fiction Show. Today joining us is Inky founder and CEO, Dave Baggett. Dave, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. I always enjoy recording these, especially when I get to talk to one of our portfolio CEOs about uh, life, uh, cybersecurity, science fiction. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about Inky. Isn't that right? Yeah, maybe some video games thrown in there too. Let's well, let's start with that. So, so Inky <laughs> is not Inky's like your third thing, right? You've done Inky's your, the third thing I've been involved with. I wasn't a founder of the first startup I was involved with, but I was the first employee. And then I was co-founder of a second company, which was in travel tech. And then uh, Inky's the first one that I was really the primary founder of. Well, let's let's walk through that. So you're a native of of Maryland. Mm -hmm. and Grew up in Columbia. Grew up in Columbia, Maryland, which is where I'm where I'm, I'm filming this, and I think I think we're both virtually filming this, which is which is great. And you went to University of Maryland, right? And what what you study there? Double majored in linguistics and computer science. Linguistics and computer science, and just for which, there's actually a time. funny story about why linguistics, because when I did orientation, I did it the last day you were able to do it because I had a summer job, and I couldn't get any classes. You know, I couldn't get all the classes I wanted. I had like a hole in my schedule. So I'm walking around the record armory. This is back when they had literally a big paper on the wall that showed what classes were available. And the only thing left was Linguistics 101. So I'm like, I guess I'm taking Linguistics 101. And so when then I think of I, Linguistics, I'm thinking of like Ahura from, from Star Trek and stuff. So what did, what did you learn in Linguistics? So linguistics at, at Maryland follows the Chomsky program. And that basically started with Noam Chomsky in the 50s. And his primary, the, the sort of underlying core principle of that research program is that humans are born with what's called universal grammar, like built into their brain. So you don't learn language tabula rasa. You have a language learning capability that's part of your brain when you're born. And so the extension of that theory is that all languages are fundamentally the same, except you learn your native language by learning parameter settings. And of course, the vocabulary varies from language to language. But the idea is there's a single grammar for all of language. And even though languages seem very different to us, they're all really fundamentally a projection of this brain hardware that we have. And there's a lot of evidence for that. And, the, and that so, so essentially, it's trying to the linguistics program is trying to understand what is the hardware in your brain? and How does it work? Did you ever read Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash? Sure, yeah. Where it talks about hacking, you know, into in, into the wetware that we have in our brains, you know, through that kind of base, yeah, linguistics. That's that's awesome. Now, of course, University of Maryland, great school. You learn all this linguistics and computer science. Did it teach you innovation? Did it teach you how to start businesses? Yeah, to some extent. Although that kind of I think was baked into me from my parents. My mom was a freelance writer. In fact, she started writing freelance when I was born. She had worked done. She had been in, at IBM and I think it was IBM and then NSA as a technical writer. Um, and then decided when I was born, she would freelance so she could be home with me. And that sort of made me immersed in an entre entrepreneurial environment from the beginning for all the good and bad that entrepreneurship entails. <laughs> so I think that sort of was baked in from the beginning, but but certainly, you know, and, and I had discovered computers at a very early age because because my father was was also an NSA person. And as a result of that, he knew a lot about computing very early in the personal computing era. So in 1977, he literally built an 8-bit computer yeah, it was called a Heath for, kit. Was it an Amdahl? <laughs> what, what did he buy? It was like an Amdahl. It was a Heath yeah. kit, which was a Z80-based machine, mm -hmm. and it had a whopping 64K of RAM, and it was text only. But I got to play with that when I was seven. So I got really interested in building stuff and entrepreneurship really from a very young age. And that's why I studied computer science at Maryland because I was interested in computers from basically as long as I could, long ago as I could remember. That's great. So your first computer, did you, what was it? Atari 400, PC Junior, what was it? Well, we had that Heath kit, which nobody remembers anymore. Uh, and then I got an Atari 400, which was a hilarious machine because it was the same hardware as the Atari 800. In other words, it was a 6502 based machine. So one of the early microprocessors, but it had this membrane keyboard. <laughs> it didn't have regular keys. And it was just impossible to type on this thing. So it was a massive upgrade for me when I finally upgraded to an Atari 800 because that had a real keyboard. Um, and that was a really interesting time to learn 
to program because unlike now, as the programmer, you had control over every aspect of the machine. There was no multiple processes. There was no separation between the user program and the kernel or any, there was no concept of privileged anything. So you could just write to physical memory, <laughs> you know, do turn the screen upside down or crash the machine or whatever. It was, it was a very um, a liberating kind of environment to learn, although also kind of challenging because you couldn't do that much without writing quite a yeah. bit of code. So I, I had an Atari 800 as well. And, and it was, I, I can remember getting magazines and getting yeah, typing in. Yeah. Like and antique magazine and like manually <laughs> typing it in. Yeah. Right. They, and the funny thing, I only understood that much later, but often they'd have you type in basic, but it was all, remember it was all data statements mm -hmm. and the data was basically just binary for the assembly code. It was basically machine code turned into hex. And so my friends and I would actually sit with each other and one friend would read the hex and the other one would type in and you'd type in pages and pages and pages of this hex. That's crazy. That's crazy. crazy. So but yeah, that was, you did, and, you, you did and then you have a real company and game we're going to talk about that. If you typed you did, it all in right. So what do you think that implies for kids who are learning programming today or people who are just learning program for the first time that it's, it's changed so much? Well, it's, it's something I think a lot about in some ways I can lament that no one will have that kind of experience again. And it was a very brief period of time where you could have that experience, because if you think about it, there's really no reason to make a machine like the Atari 800. Now, the only reason we made it then is because we couldn't make anything better. So there's this very short period of a couple decades at most where those were the state of the art machines and all their weird quirks. And all the flexibility of those was just the byproduct of the limitations of the era. And that'll never happen again. I know there are some attempts. There's a like a virtual game system called Pico 8 that people have made where it's it's a virtual 8-bit machine and there are virtual cartridges and it's trying to recapture some of that vibe of creating software with all those constraints on those small machines. But that's pretty fringe, right? So the norm is going to be someone writes code in JavaScript or something. And it's very different. And I think a consequence of it is that it's much harder to do anything at all, to see any result at all now. You know, like try to write a Windows program. There's huge amounts of boilerplate to even put a letter on the screen, right? That was a lot better back in the day. You could type in literally a line of basic and see the result instantly. So we've lost that to some extent. On the other hand, the tools that we have to make real programs are vastly better than they were then so it's a mix i think it's it's sort of disappointing that there won't be that sort of same joy of discovery but it is much more straightforward to make real software now than it was then i mean it was hard to do anything at all with those machines they were so limited and even though they were so limited they were also enclosed right everything you wrote was on the computer there was no concept of client server let alone the cloud yeah, I mean, the closest we had was bulletin board systems, right? Where you'd have your modem. And I actually remember we had an acoustic coupling modem, which most people probably don't even know what that is. But when you had a handset phone, like you'd get from AT&T back in the day, some of the modems, you would literally physically plug the phone into these suction cup things. <laughs> it was like, and that was your modem. <laughs> Instead of talking on the phone, you just stick it in suction cups and it was 300 baud. So you could type faster than this thing could transmit. And there was a really a thriving, as you probably remember, a thriving BBS culture where you could go in there and share files and stuff. And it was this tantalizing precursor to the internet, but there was no concept of distributed computing really. In fact, even when we were working on Crash Bandicoot, the game in the, I guess that would be 94, mid nineties. Even then, the idea of distributed computation was pretty novel. We used some of those ideas to pre-compute the levels and divide the pre-computation of the levels across all of the silicon graphics workstations that the artists had. But that wasn't a normal thing to do, and there wasn't really out-of-the-box software to run processes on different machines like that. So in the 80s, it was really far-fetched, and even in the mid-90s, it was kind of a uh, it was kind of remarkable if you had software that could actually distribute the computation across multiple nodes.
So take us through the origin story of being a successful video game developer. Who did you work for? What did you do with the company? How big was the company? All, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we started. So I met the two guys who founded Naughty Dog, the game company, which still exists, by the way. I met them at MIT because after Maryland, I graduated with, again, a CS and linguistics degree. And I went to MIT to the AI lab to join the PhD program and studied computational linguistics, which is kind of the combination of computer science and linguistics. And I met two people there, one of whom was in the same PhD program, Andy Gavin, and his friend who had been working with him. And they'd been publishing games since like seventh grade. So they were both sort of prodigies. And, you know, people probably know of Electronic Arts now as this behemoth company. Well, they were publishing games back in the 80s for Super Nintendo and and Sega Genesis, and you know, and, and when I met Andy and Jason, they had just published a game called Rings of Power for the Sega Genesis. So I was obviously immediately very taken with that and very interested in that because I had always wanted to make games. I had done a little bit of professional programming, but nothing on on that scale. And make a long story short, you know, we became really good friends. Andy decided to leave with the masters, and they got essentially a royalty agreement from Universal Studios, who was creating a division called Universal Interactive, because all the movie studios wanted to get into games and they called it interactive. So they had this new division and one of their first projects was essentially to fund Andy and Jason to make, make some games. And ultimately that, that project of making games, uh, and that was around 94 and I joined them also left with the masters and joined them in 1994. And in interesting, I originally worked on a 3D shooter kind of game, almost like Doom or something. But then we consolidated all of our efforts into this single game that was what was going to be called a character-based action game at the time. And at that time, there were games like that. Obviously, Mario, everyone knows Mario. There was 2D Mario, Mario World. The concept was, hey, can we do that same kind of gameplay in three dimensions? And so the whole team decided we should just unify all of our efforts behind that, efforts behind the Sony PlayStation, which was a brand new machine then. And it was initially seven of us total in the whole company. Andy and, and I were the only the, developers. Yeah, so Mario um, was out. And and so what, what, this was for the, the, the Nintendo. This was for, for what platform? So our game, Crash, which was not called Crash at that time. It was working title was Willy the Wombat. It was always meant for PlayStation. So the PlayStation is interesting because at that time it was a new brand new system from a brand new player. The market was utterly dominated by Sega and Nintendo at that time. So the idea that Sony would come in and even take a, take a stab at it was kind of remarkable. And it, and it happened because <clears throat> Sony and Nintendo had a failed partnership. Essentially, Nintendo walked away from it and left Sony holding the bag. So Sony decided, well, fine, then we're going to go do our own one. And I think at the time... The industry was probably that was totally possible. Now, of course, Sega's gone. <laughs> it's Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft are the thriving ones. So, but then it was a very interesting time because you had this new entrant of Sony. You had the transition occurring from two-dimensional graphics, purely raster graphics, to three-dimensional graphics where the scenes are constructed of polygons, not pixels. Obviously, the pixels make the, you know the polygons are rendered as pixels, but when you make a three-dimensional game. The objects are really three-dimensional objects. They're meshes of, of polygons. And that was a whole different kind of hardware required, and it was a very different set of constraints. And so our, our objective was, can we take the good things about games like Mario, Donkey Kong Country was a big influence for us, for us on the Super Nintendo, and translate them, to, translate them into a three-dimensional environment. And that turned out to be very hard for a bunch of reasons. But ultimately, we succeeded. It took us about two and a half years to do that whole cycle on the first game. How, uh, how big was the team? How many coders did you have? How many people did like the art and music? What was that like? Yeah, there were seven of us. Two of us worked, Andy and I worked on the game, primary game code. We had a third programmer helped with sound programming and then everyone else was artists essentially. And so, and seven total. So it was a very small team. At that time, the Mario 64 team at Nintendo was over 60 people. And that was certainly a peer game of ours, both technically and it was sort of contemporaneous. So that gives you an idea of how 
short staffed we were versus typical teams in the industry. And now what's remarkable is, is sort of the same benefit and curse that I mentioned when you went from 8-bit to modern computing. To make a game now that's triple A, what we would call triple A, meaning the highest quality, Crash was meant to be a triple A game. To make a triple A game now requires 500 to 1,000 people. And the amount of assets in a game like that and the amount of code makes them among the most complicated pieces of software that's created now, full stop. I think that's But then you could do it with seven people. You could do it with seven people back then. It was hard to do it with seven people, but you could certainly do it with like 15 people. Yeah, we interviewed Sid Meier for the show, and I got I kind of got the impression that he did 99% of the work on some of those early games. And I definitely Oh, for think, sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's almost a thousand people to get like a Call of Duty or something yeah. like that. But then just for people who are programming and putting that, I mean, did you have CBS? Were you coding in, or CSV? Did you have uh, assembly? Like what were you doing to kind of manage the code? <clears throat> yeah, we used code? We use version control. We actually use CB, CBS version control. I don't think Subversion existed yet, and Git definitely didn't. <clears throat> but we did use version control. And we wrote, we wrote a lot of it in hybrid C, C++, because C++ was very immature and kind of broken in various ways. And so we kind of, we use C++, but really a mostly C subset of it. And then lots of, basically the entire rendering engine, um, all the collision detection code. I mean, all the code that I wrote was assembly language. So that was basically writing an R3000 MIPS assembly language, which nobody would do anymore, right? I mean, I can't even imagine, except for like the ciphers in OpenSSL, no one's writing assembly anymore ever. But that was, you kind of had to do that to make it fast enough. So it was a combination of assembly, very C-ish, C++. And then Andy actually created his own domain specific language called ghoul which was a lisp dialect and all the creatures and all the all the things that moved in the foreground and also all the menus for things like load and save all that stuff was done in lisp using this ghoul language that andy wrote i've, I've learned that a lua is used in a lot of different of uh, the modern video games and i think yep. people who learn python and lua are kind of amazed that there might be some of that running at call of duty when you're throwing a grenade oh yeah yeah screen. that's that's crazy so do you still play video games today did you were you, were you yeah in fact i mean i play civ 6 which is sid meyer's uh, most recent game obviously he's you know part of a giant team now uh but yeah i mean i i tend to like those i like i tend to like casual games i'm not so much into call of duty or these really hardcore fps games but more casual games and then things some of the rts's and turn-based games like civ are interesting any thoughts on the current, you know, Xbox, PlayStation Wars, even virtual reality? So my uh, my very good friend, Mark Cerny, actually is the principal architect for PS5. So while he never says anything secret about it, I certainly have some feeling of, you know, I think at least being in the loop on it. And I think that PS5 does a bunch of interesting things. And one thing that's kind of conceptually simple, but it, but it makes a huge difference. I actually did... I, I actually do have a PS5. They're impossible to get, but I went on StockX and paid <laughs> extra to get one. They He basically built in a very high-performance SSD into the design, and that means things load really, really quickly. And one of the things that we struggled with throughout the PS1 to PS4 era was load times. You know, because even in Crash, one of the one of the most ambitious things that that we did and andy was responsible for this was we were loading stuff off the cd to populate the level as crash ran through it and it was barely fast enough to do that and only if you laid out the data on the disc exactly right and there's a funny story when the when the sony people decided hey we're going to publish crash as our own game essentially make it first party they did this whole technical analysis of it and they were totally horrified because the MTBF that they had, the mean time between failure on the CD drive, was way, way, way too low for us to be doing what we were doing. And they were really worried if we shift our game, it would kill all the CD-ROM drives and the PlayStation 1s that were already in the field because we were just hammering this thing constantly. And they never expected you would use it in that way. But to their credit, it just ended up being fine. <laughs> Actually, they were way conservative on their estimation of the lifespan of those CDs and they, were, and they were fine. But load times have always been a really serious challenge. So I think it's kind of interesting that now that you're sort of 
everyone's sort of topping out on what you can do in terms of polygons per second or CPU rates. You know, Mark actually did some interesting trade-offs there to make the thing almost feel like a cartridge system in how fast it loads. Because the great thing about that golden age of you put the Super Nintendo cartridge in, the game comes up in under a second. That that like awesome immediacy was just lost through the whole disc-based era. And so PS4 kind of recaptures that, which I think is cool. And then there's all kinds of other hardware innovations in all these systems, but I think largely they're pretty, they're getting pretty comparable to each other because in the period from let's say 1980 to five years ago, almost all of the gains have already happened, right? You're not going to get a million times more processing power like you did between 1977 and now. It's just not possible. Like the feature sizes on these chips are so small, they can't possibly get much smaller, right? So we're going to have a leveling out of the hardware. That was where all the competition was, right? Like Nintendo would put in some special graphics hardware. They would have an advantage for a generation. That's mostly gone. And now it's going to be more like design choices. Do you think we're ever going to get to a point where we play video games over Netflix, where the entire experience is streamed? Oh, it's already there. So you can use PlayStation now. And it is that essentially you can play all of these old PS one, two, three games completely as streaming video you don't know it's streaming video and it's a little laggy it's not great in some ways you certainly it would be can't great play, for, you know like a modern shooter like call of duty you know where you're doing no scope you know 360 headshots that's yeah <laughs> they're but they're all getting there i mean amazon has a cloud gaming service now they're all going this direction where you know it will also essentially i'll be running on these graphics cards on servers in the cloud that's, that's, that's a great experience. I appreciate you sharing that. And of course, everybody who's been involved with a video game uh, production eventually goes to reimagine how people book airplane tickets and make all that stuff work on the back end. How did you end up doing that as your next gig? In fact, the, the company that's who did it, it's a lot of Oh, did I lose you? You lost me for a while. Now you're back. All right, we'll have to edit we that, can edit out. that out. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, 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 I'll do break out. break and I'll ask that question again. So of course, everybody who, you know, has an awesome career, you know, bringing a game to, to market that a lot of people are familiar with goes off to reinvent how uh, airplanes figure out open seating and stuff behind us. <laughs> so how do you end up doing that? Yeah, that's what we do. I mean, no, it's kind of funny because the nexus of those things the nexus of those is really MIT because the AI lab was also where I met the founder of ITA, which is the travel tech company you mentioned, which is now Google Flights. So nobody knows what ITA was, but everybody's used Google Flights. That was because Google acquired that company. That was started by two people in the AI lab, one of whom was my office mate when I was there. So that's sort of the connection. And, you know, we sort of looked at it as, Gee, there have been these systems that have been automating air travel in various ways since the 60s. Sabre, for example, which a lot of people have heard of, that was one of the first mainframe-based systems to store passenger records. And it was like, I mean, way early, like 1962 or something. Just an incredible, incredible achievement in computing, those systems. But one of the problems with being an early adopter of technology like the airlines were, is that then 50 years later, you're still running the same stuff and now it's really old. <laughs> so we looked at some of these problems in particular, the problem of, hey, I'm a person and I wanna go from Baltimore to LA. Like what's the best way to do that given my constraints? My constraints probably have to do with money, time, airline choice. And that turns out to be a really hard problem. And so sort of naively when we looked at this travel agent systems circa 1996 or seven, we're like, wow, these are really horrible. Like you put it in Baltimore to LA and you get nine answers all on United that go through Chicago. It's like, what if you don't like United? What if you don't want to take a stop? They were not able to do a reasonable job of the search. So we thought we're MIT computer scientists, we can do a better job. And that was ultimately true, but it turned out to be a lot more complicated than just, in, than just invoking computer science. <laughs> it, turned, it turned out that it required an absolutely massive amount of domain specific knowledge about how the whole airfare pricing system works uh 
which is a complete mystery to all but a hundred people on earth, basically. It's incredibly complicated and very specialized. And so we had to take computer science and sort of add to that all this crazy domain knowledge uh, to produce this system. And it took, I mean, really five years to get to an MVP system. Something that was also, even plausible, right? Yeah. And this is this is years before like sort of the openness of like Kayak or Airbnb or where there's publishing and people are just trying to like meet supply and you bid on it. What, what, what did you have to deal with? Did you have to like, you know, meet in these back rooms and get information on pricing from the airlines? Like how yeah, to some work? extent. I mean, Kayak, Kayak, for example, was a customer of ours. So Kayak used our pricing engine. And the, the fact of the matter is there were only four, maybe five, depending on how you counted, only four pieces of software on planet Earth that could price an airline ticket at that time. It was so complicated and so many, it's like a million lines of code to price an airline ticket. As, as hard as that is to believe, that's, that's, that's still true today. And, and so, yeah, we had to go to this nonprofit organization called ATPCO, which stands for Airline Tariff Publishing Company, that's owned by the airlines essentially, and evolved out of the Civil Aeronautics Board, the CAB. <clears throat> Remember, Carter and then ultimately Reagan deregulated the airlines. So that, that meant the cab then became not a mandator of fares, but a clearinghouse for fares. So ATPCO is an offshoot of that. So we literally went in person to ATPCO at Dulles Airport and took these courses from them on how airline, you know, the pricing worked. And we kept coming back and they kept saying, you guys are the only people that have ever come back. <laughs> like everybody else left after the first the first day <laughs> just gave up so yeah there was some of that the other challenge was the challenge and opportunity was oh my god there's this thing the internet is anyone ever going to buy tickets online well maybe that seems kind of scary but maybe they'll do that and all of a sudden it was like oh my god everyone's going to buy all their tickets online how do we possibly do enough searches to power that because the problem was in, in the back in the day, you called a travel agent and the travel agent would type on a keyboard and it would be like a minute for each search. Well, now with the internet, if I can just go onto a website as an end consumer, I'll just sit there, I can do hundred searches in 10 minutes, right? So the volume of searching versus the volume of booking massively went up and the systems that the airlines had been built on were not not built to handle anywhere near that volume. In particular, the thing that I worked the most on, both from a software development standpoint and then almost from a political advocacy standpoint was the seat availability, seat availability infrastructure. Because you could get the fares from that ATP co, those would tell you what something would cost, assuming there was availability. Then you could get the schedules from this other company, OAG, that would tell you where the planes were going to fly when, but you couldn't figure out if anything was actually for sale without checking seat availability, which changed in real time. And this, and basically you had to query like United Airlines, Hey, is flight 12? Do you have booking code Q? Like you had to send a real time message. And the problem was the volume they could support was like 30 a second. Now 30 a second doesn't sound terrible, but we needed a million a second. Literally, to power the kind of searching volume that was happening online. So we essentially had to build out a whole new infrastructure to compute the same results as United and other airlines would with their mainframe systems, only doing it on Linux machines with acres of computers doing it in parallel. And not only Linux machines, but did you have to build your own sort of telco connectivity so you could get the queries? Uh, very early, out? yes. Yeah. We very early had not only we, we to get availability queries, we had these things called FRADs, F-R-A-D. And I have no idea what that stands for. It was some kind of modem, some incredibly expensive modem. And then I remember also the ATP guys excitedly telling us circa 2000 or 2001, we have this new technology. It's awesome. It's FTP. <laughs> FTP <laughs> is like the most basic file trend. Because before that, they were only able to transfer files using this protocol SNA. So you had to buy this, you had to buy this IBM SNA server software, like 
just to get the fares. And actually, initially, they didn't even have electronic connections, so they would send us boxes of tapes, like mag tapes. So one of the first things that Carl did, Carl's our chief scientist and, and one of our co-founders, he went to this sort of secondhand computer hardware shop in Cambridge and bought this gigantic Kennedy tape drive and then wrote a Linux driver for it so he could actually read the tapes that ATP Co was sending us. I mean, it was crazy. So there was some of that kind of early pre-internet telecom work, but that was mostly over by 2003 or four. And then we kind of at least had TCP IP connections and FTP at least. So it was stuff you could do with a normal Linux <laughs> system. So back in the turn of the century time, you know, you had Y2K, uh, I'm curious what your thoughts on that are, but I also want to know, uh, you know, what, what were some of the gimmicks? Like, you know, do you wait till like, you know, two months to buy your ticket? Like when was the best time to buy, buy a ticket? So yeah, Y2K, what were some games people played? Well, one of the things that's funny about the, uh, terrifying and funny about the airline data is it's electronic rules. So it's all done in computer readable formats, like a programmer would do maybe, except the people who designed this stuff were not computer scientists or programmers or IT people, they were airline tariff experts. And so there's this kind of bizarre legacy of their choices, like there are 26 different ways to represent a date. So they didn't just have a Y2K problem, they had it times 26. <laughs> Why do you need 26 to every different type of data had a different style of date because that's just the way they did it. And then they had Boolean logic, like the ability to put different predicates together with and and or and not, except they kind of did it like English language, the meaning of and and or. So sometimes and meant or, or in computer science, and sometimes or meant and. <laughs> and it totally depended on the rule category. So the whole and 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 there's also the issue of this stuff was entered by humans into terminals green screens so we'd also have the issue of oh there's a fair but there's capital o's in it instead of zeros so it's not really a number it's like one two three o so you'd have to just deal with all these data entry issues so we had this tool at purify <laughs> like scan looking for all these possible errors. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it was, it was an interesting thing. Cause now of course you would just say, do everything in JSON, right? It's kind of like we have modern standards. There's a reasonable way everyone's agreed on to do things. It wasn't like that at all then. So, so people just made everything up arbitrarily and it was very ad hoc. And the legacy of that is just massive complexity, which still exists to this day. So did you get to go work at Google after the acquisition happened? I decided not to actually, because I wanted to do another startup, but almost everybody at ITA did end up working at Google for, for a long time. Actually, most people stayed and a lot of people are still there. So it was a very successful decision. acquisition. Yeah, we've had a lot of companies get acquired and it's always interesting talking to the team, the engineers, the founders, are they gonna go? Do they have a chance to leave? Do they leave after a while? That's uh, that that that's interesting. But what did you do? So what did you do after ITA? So after I actually I actually started the precursor to what became Inky as almost like an incubator to explore ideas in email, which I know probably now people think sounds like complete insanity. <laughs> like what what were you thinking email? But you know at the time. Email seemed like to me, it was going to become even more ubiquitous than it already was, despite the fact that you had all these competing other communication channels. So there was this period in the late 2000s, even, where people said, well, there's not going to be email anymore, because everything's going to be on Facebook. And I even going back to 2008, 2007 timeframe, when I really started thinking a lot about email, I never believed that I always believed that these new communication channels were largely additive that they were not just going to displace. Now, sure, no one uses the telegraph anymore, right? But at some point, things like email are so wired into the fabric of the world, it takes a very, very long time to shed them. And the analogy I use is like the plumbing under Manhattan. You may not like it, but you are stuck with it.
so I was very interested in the the kind of all the issues around email affecting communication globally. Ultimately, that became a focus on security aspects of email. Like Inky's really focused on email security, but initially it was also about things like productivity. Like even now, when I use Outlook, the search is terrible. Like why can't I search my inbox letter at a time and get instant results? Like, why do some things just not come up when I search? It's just bad. So we did a lot of work to try to fix some of those things, but ultimately decided that really the most pressing issue was security issues around email. And that's, you know, now it's phishing that we talk about most, but there's a whole panoply of security issues around email. But email changed a lot over the last 15 years. We, we went from, you know, thick clients like CC mail to web clients and some mm -hmm. people still hold their, their, uh, their, their thick clients. Of course, your, your phones have apps for do that. You know, we have things like IMAP where, you know, I think mm -hmm. a lot of people forgot how to configure IMAP and then, you know, the, the concept of running your own email server it used to be you ran your right. own email server and now you just kind of, it just kind of goes through Google. Right. You know, so right. what do yeah. you think some of the bigger changes have been over the last couple of years? Well, one thing that nobody thinks about now, but is kind of remarkable is email predates the idea of, of what they called multimedia in the nineties. Like the, what people might have heard of MIME, M-I-M-E because of MIMEcast. The MIME in MIMEcast comes from multimedia, something or other mail extensions. In other words, in the nineties, it was this amazing new idea that, hey, like you could put an image in a mail, like, or use fonts. <laughs> That'd be so cool, wouldn't it? And so, all that stuff was retroactively grafted onto email. And then uh, there was another wave of stuff grafted onto email for things like security. In the limit, there's something called S-MIME, which DOD uses, it's very complicated. But even things that now a lot of people are familiar with, at least in cybersecurity, like DKIM, those were grafted on security features to try to, to address some of the limitations that were baked into mail because it was like i mean the mail standards from 1971 it didn't even have the concept of security because there's like 10 of us on the internet what are we gonna do it's not like we're gonna attack each other so they just didn't even think about security it's kind of interesting how mail has survived and even thrived there are more mailboxes now than there ever have been and the growth rates continuing at a massive rate it's just been a very resilient standard throughout decades of, of development. I think that's kind of interesting. And it's because it's a federated standard, I've always found it appealing. It's not controlled by a single entity. Now that is unfortunately changing. Like you mentioned, running your own mail server, kind of impossible to do that now because if it used to be AOL, now it's Google and Microsoft. If the big mail handlers just decide your IP is bad, you're never going to get mail delivered. There's no recourse. There's no one to talk to. There's like, you're just doomed. So the federation of mail has sort of become curtailed and now it's once again controlled by a handful of entities in practice. But that notion of, hey, anyone could run a mail server is still pretty cool, I think. It's still pretty unique for modern protocols that we still use. I, I still remember the first few years at Tenable, we, we, it was hotly debated. If you're gonna send out a customer support mailing list or you know, a list of people who subscribe to a mailing list, was it going to be HTML or was it going to be well-written text? Was it going to have new lines in that text? Right. It, it's, th these are like, these are like big issues for us. And, and now yeah. of course, you know, the email you get, you know, has uh, JavaScript trackers to detect open rates and all that, all that kind of stuff. Crazy times. So yeah. when you, as you were doing all this stuff, you said, we want to solve security and there's, you touched on authentication, you touched on, on attribution, you touched on a lot of different things. You start Inky. Give mm -hmm. us a pitch on what Inky is. So the fundamental problem Inky's solving is, you know, email doesn't have reliable sender, proof of sender, essentially. So you get a mail, it looks like it's from Microsoft. You have no idea whether it really is. That's a byproduct of the standards being weak. And the byproduct of, you know, authentication, like you mentioned, is not really a first class citizen in the mail world still. Again, you can accomplish it sort of with S-MIME, but it's such a pain that no one sets that up. So fundamentally, we looked at this problem of phishing where you get this mail, you think it's from a person that you trust, or you think it's from a brand you trust, 
and it isn't. And you're fooled into doing something you didn't want to do, like wiring money, paying a fake invoice, logging into some fake credential harvesting site. We looked at that as a central, if not the central problem of cybersecurity. It was obvious even as early as like 2015. This is a central problem of cybersecurity because it's super easy for the attacker. It's super cheap. And it can cause the victim to do anything within the firewall, right? So I'm the user inside the network. I open some attachment or I pay some invoice. I'm just like an agent operating on behalf of this attacker effectively because I'm duped into thinking, oh, this is my boss or this is, a, this is Microsoft. So we were, became very aware of that as a problem. And we were kind of surprised by like, why are these mail protection systems that have been around 20 years, like not blocking this stuff? What's the problem? And in fact, one of the early angels I pitched, in fact, before I pitched you and Cindy, I pitched an angel, particular angel, and he said, like, you're going to have to convince me there's anything to do in mail protection because I can't believe that's true. How is it not solved by the big companies? And the key insight we developed, which is essentially what we do at Inky is, is to address this issue is, the entire mail protection infrastructure that's been built up over the last 30 years is based on content classification. The idea that I can have a Bayesian model or pattern matching or something that tells me this content in this mail is bad content. It has the word Viagra a lot of times. It has dollar signs. Like it's something bad about it. It started with spam, right? So we could classify those are spammy mails. Those are good mails. Train a model to recognize from the content of the mail, distinguish the spam from the ham. And our key insight was, you know what? If I'm a fisher and I want you to think of Microsoft, all I have to do is take a mail I got from Microsoft and resend that to you. And then by definition, the content is identical. So how is a content classifier ever going to know that's bad? In essence, it's not bad because of the content. It's bad because of the disparity between the apparent sender, Microsoft, and the actual sender, some random attacker. So we set ourselves in a, using a couple different technologies that were really developed in academia in the 2010s. We set ourselves a task of identifying forgery in email, like augmenting all these content classification tools that had built up over decades with a new set of tools which were able to discern forgery from first principles. And from the end user standpoint, that's how it all works. From the end user standpoint, you now get mails that don't go straight to quarantine. They don't get delivered silently. Some of your mail gets delivered with a yellow banner that says, hey, you know what? This might not be from who you think it is. We can't prove this isn't really Ron. Maybe somebody took over Ron's account. It's coming from his real email account. Doesn't look like something he would have written though. So we can't prove this isn't Ron, but we're kind of thinking it's not. So just be advised, this is not, not necessarily Ron, and we put a yellow banner right in the mail. And that, that's kind of the projection of all that technology into the user experience, and that's what the users see, right? From the user standpoint, they see, I use Inky, and Inky sees things in the mail that I can't as a human, and tells me about them in a yellow banner that I get in the mail. So let's rewind that a little bit. Most of our viewers, are probably customers or free users of like Outlook or Gmail. And if you, you know, if you're Bob at gmail.com, you have to authenticate as Bob as gmail.com before you can send an mm -hmm. email from Bob at gmail.com. But back in the day, you could just connect to a, an email server and you could say, who's it from? I'm from Bob at gmail.com. I'm from- You still can, yeah. You, you still can in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. So this concept of sending a fake email mm -hmm. is something I think culture has, has we, we've kind of lost because the majority of what we interact with, we, we authenticate to Facebook, we authenticate to Gmail, you know, that sort of thing. But then the, 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 you, you mentioned Bayesian classification and that's mm -hmm. probably something worth going into. It's almost like fuzzy logic, if you will, but, but there's, no, there's no keyword like Viagra. Like right? if you can't just- block Viagra because then you won't get, you know, your Viagra pills. And, and that's, and you, you can't just do that from on and off. So talk a little bit more about this filtering problem. Yeah. I mean, there's also, there's the filtering problem, which is it's hard to make a model smart enough to evaluate the content. And again, again, think about the use, think about the case I mentioned where I send you a mail I got from Microsoft 
the body of that male is identical. So the con whatever, imagine some infinitely powerful AI that can analyze that content. What's it possibly going to say except for it's the same as the real content from Microsoft. <laughs> There's, an, it's, it's almost like the reason that I, I tell people to do phishing awareness simulations, not because you can train users to recognize fish because you can't, but because it trains them to understand you cannot trust who you think a male is from. And again, like if a user sees a male that is perfectly styled as though it's from Microsoft, because it really is from Microsoft and all the attacker did was save his HTML, there's nothing the person's going to learn how to see because it's visually identical, right? So there's limitations to the filtering stuff that are technological. There's also just fundamental, it's like a category error. If what's happening is the attacker is forging the mail and making it appear to be from someone it isn't from, the filtering isn't going to tell you that. The content classification is not going to tell you that. Now, another related scenario that people don't think so much about because they often think, oh, well, there's DKIM. So now I can prove that mail came from Microsoft.com. So now I can be sure all mail from Microsoft is legitimate, right? Wrong. Because if I'm a smart attacker, I just register a new domain. ms-sysupdate.com is one we saw in the last month. I go on there, I go on to Namecheap. I pay a dollar of Bitcoin to register this new domain. I set up DKIM and SPF and everything. I run my own mail server. I send the mail from that and it looks perfect. Now the user looks at it and says, msysupdate.com. I mean, that could be real. So the problem is not Microsoft.com's domain. You can prove it came from that. It's like, what are all the domains that they use? They don't even know, right? So, so the problem is a lot more difficult than people think initially. And these things like DKIM, they are attempts to try to put some measure of, you know, digital signatures, some chain of custody back to a particular entity. But it kind of shifts the problem. Like, so now I, okay, I can prove the mail came from msysupdate.com. Who's that, right? Like I just shifted the problem up a level. Now I got to figure out from who is data, who's that? Well, I can't really do that because who is data is all anonymized. So this is the kind of thing that is the reason that it's still a problem and why Techniques like we use, which really are a lot closer to trying to mimic the human response to the mail, why those become important. So what Inky does is it looks at the mail and tries to, tries to sort of in the computer decide if I gave this mail to a person, who would they think it's from? Like, would they see the mail as a person and say, oh, I get that. That's Microsoft because I see a Windows logo and I know that branding. That's really important for Inky to know because then Inky can say, oh, well, is this sender of this mail? Even if I can prove it came from msysupdate.com, I, Inky, know that's not really Microsoft because I know the list of 100 or 200 real domains Microsoft sends mail from. But what I think a lot of people miss is the fact that you don't know to, to query, you don't know to assert that it's Microsoft unless you know that's what the person will perceive it as being from, right? And that's actually the hard problem. The hard problem is trying to mimic that incredibly amazing human visual system ability to recognize things like brand in one second. It's very similar to the language problem. Like you can speak natively in your own language without any awareness of how complicated that is. But when as linguists, we try to look at, well, what are the rules of language exactly? We quickly get into situations where, oh my God, this is like incredibly complicated. We have no idea what the rules are. And there's that same kind of there's that same kind of dichotomy with what we see. And, and in, in essence, the attackers, the fishers are so good at fishing because the humans are so good at recognizing brand, right, in males. And also their boss or their HR person or so, so on. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. So when I was running Tenable, I had an email come to me. It was the Bank of Nigeria. And mm -hmm. I kind of begrudgingly send it over to our, you know, the man who was running our European and African sales. And it turned out to be a legit email from the bank in Nigeria. They were- <laughs> So that's not a good customer. filter criteria to block Yeah, so, and that's a yeah. really good example that if you were just yeah. filtering, you know, Nigeria yeah. in the front, you can't, you know, you can't do that. But, but right now I kind of look at email issues, you know, generally phishing, spear phishing, and then business compromising. How, how do you break it up and 
What kind of examples of that stuff did you see during during COVID? Oh, just a massive amount of a massive amount of really interesting stuff. I mean, one of the things that's kind of fun, it's terrifying, but it's kind of fun is we can often see mail. Many of our customers allow us to our analysts to analyze reported fish. So we don't store people's mail and we can't see people's customers' mail, except in the one instance where they allow us to see reported fish. And so we have analysts that look at the reported fish. And in that case, they can see the raw mail. Again, customers don't have to let us do that, but most do because they want to they wanna help us. And we can see in almost real time how these techniques evolve. And they're just utterly fascinating. Many of them are things that exploit things like COVID, like you mentioned. Like we saw ones that mimicked the company's own branding so it looked like it was from your company with your company's own branding. And it said, you know, something like we regret that one of your colleagues has died from COVID. So log in here to get the details. I mean, there's nothing more shameless than that than I can imagine. And it is very, very effective, right? So, and again, that's the idea of the person who receives that is going to believe it's their HR department. Similarly, They'll get a mail that appears to be from payroll. Hey, you got a bonus. Log in here to get your to get your pay stub, and it's credential harvesting. They log into what looks like their their own company, and it's actually the attacker's web page. Just looks similar. But interestingly, so there's things that exploit real world stuff like that. We see it around holiday time too. All the fake Amazon survey get a gift card stuff targeting consumers that all goes it totally explodes in October November but the other kind of thing we see which I think is really interesting is the exploitation of the weaknesses of the mainstream systems these incumbent systems that have been around that have all the market share the attackers know exactly how they work it's almost like you know when we talk about cryptography we always assume the attacker knows our whole crypto algorithm well, that's actually true. The attackers do know the entire proof point algorithm. They know exactly what they're doing. And they're using techniques now to reliably transit those systems because they're using essentially knowledge of how those systems work. Example would be most of those systems still rely heavily on content classification. They look for words like Viagra in the body, right? Or they look for scam indicative phrases like, oh, please buy gift cards, right? And they'll have these giant databases of these patterns that they look for using regular expressions. So they'll have a pattern of like 20,000 patterns. They'll run the 20,000 patterns in parallel on each mail and they'll say, okay, did it match this one? Did it match this one? The attackers have found ways to completely sabotage the regex matching. A simple way is zero font. So now that we have HTML mail, we have all the complexity of HTML, CSS, Unicode, all this stuff's massively complicated. Nobody fully understands it. It's like airfare pricing. So I can, for example, take my scammy phrase. I want the user to read, please go buy gift cards. And I can put a random string of gibberish after every single letter of that and set the font size to zero. The attacker doesn't see it. I mean, the victim doesn't see it because it's literally invisible because it's font size zero. But now Proofpoint has no ability to match that because it's got all this gibberish in it. And it's a 100% reliable way to transit these systems. So one of the byproducts of that for us is that in addition to doing that visual processing where we try to mimic the human response, we also do a full render of the mail. So we actually pretend we're Outlook or we're the Gmail client as though we're painting the screen. And that lets us see, wait, why is there this zero font stuff in here? Like, or wh what does it say if you take that out and you only scan the visible text? And that kind of creates a whole new range of tools we can use. And those are the only ones that will identify these new, more sophisticated fish. And that's, it's just amazing because the attacker has an almost infinite amount of different ways they can paint a screen, right? I can put a letter in, I can put an image, I can do it. So unless you're doing that visual rendering, you're never going to catch those things. It's essentially unbounded. So for, I'll give you two examples that are just like mind blowing. Example one, and both of these are real world ones that we found by looking at 
fish that were getting through upstream systems. One was Office 365. Like you'd get this mail that said in big letters in the upper left corner, Office 365. And then it would ask you to change your password or your over quota or one of these things. Credential harvesting scam where they want you to click the call to action. It presents you with a perfect looking Office 365 login page. You dutifully type in your email address and your password. You've just given your email address and password to the attacker. See these all the time. This one was different though, because when we searched the text of the mail for the string Office 365, which is a string we would call brand indicative, not scam indicative, but brand indicative, that might tell us, for example, who the person might think it's Microsoft if it has lots of those kinds of text in there. We didn't find the string Office 365. So wait, how is it rendering Office 365? It's not an image, it's big text. How is it rendering that if it doesn't say Office 365 anywhere in the text of the mail? It's not zero font where they put extra letters in. It had Office 365 spelled backwards. And the attackers set the CSS property, this totally obscure CSS property, Unicode bidirectional override, right to left. So they basically told the rendering engine hey, even though this is Latin script and you normally render it left to right, don't do that. Render it right to left like Arabic or Hebrew. And therefore it made it come out as saying Office 365. <laughs> I mean, that's, so that's try to think of a thing that's gonna, that, I mean, that sort of gives you a sense of the other, the other example, which is easier to explain is we saw mails that had Windows logos. We see them all the time and our, and our logo classifier didn't recognize this Windows logo. So we're like, what's wrong with this? Wait, there is no Windows logo. Oh, it's an HTML table that the attacker cleverly made four squares and set the background color of the four squares. It looks exactly like a Windows logo. So this is like an unlimited field day of, of tactics for these guys. And what's amazing to me is you think, I'm sure a lot of these people are idiots who are doing this stuff. But they're clearly people who know the most bizarre, obscure corners of Unicode, CSS, HTML, how regex engines work. Like <clears throat> there are some very smart people out there that are weaponizing their intimate knowledge of these standards. Well, what I think is interesting is every founder, and I, I, I went through this. So when I was developing the Dragon Intrusion, I mean, I really felt like hey, nobody's going to get anything by me. And then I actually found that I had nation states buying the product specifically so they could, <laughs> right. they could bypass, right? <clears throat> Bypassing is so much easier than trying to prevent everything. So how about we kind of close out a little bit on the inky stuff with just what are some tips that you can tell everybody about not to trust email? What are some things you recommend to tell people? Yeah. Number one, if you're running a corporate mail system, you have to put some extra layers in place for phishing. The stuff that's provided out of the box by the mainstream vendors is not sufficient. I would recommend Inky, but you have to put something. You have free, to put something. Free, right? free evaluations, right? It's the CEO said. Ex exactly. And I, I will also say, I, I say it all the time, you know, ransomware usually comes attached to fish. And when somebody pays a $4 million ransomware, it's like, man, that would have bought them like 20 years of Inky, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so you can wait and hope, or you can do something proactive because the truth is like our customers don't get fished. We don't have the problem. It's not that it's perfect. It just makes it so much less likely than practice. It's not happening. If you don't put some extra layer like that in place, you will get fished and you will get ransomware. And sometimes we feel like we can take the horse to water, but not make it drink. <laughs> That's the number one thing. If you run corporate IT, you have to do something about phishing. That's how you solve your ransomware problem. If you are using consumer email, like you're on a Hotmail account or an AOL account, the bad news is those guys just don't want to invest in spending any more money on your free account. So you just have to not trust anything at all you get in mail, in consumer mail accounts, full stop. So for example, if you get a mail that appears to be from United Airlines and you're like, oh, I have a trip on United Airlines tomorrow. I'll just click on this email and link in the email and go to United and fill something in. Don't do that. Instead, type United into your browser, right? Go to the site directly. Don't access things through email from consumer email accounts because there's no way for you as a human to verify the identity of the sender. And there's no software in place doing that really either 
So you're just a complete sitting duck. And, and again, remember the primary way you're going to get duped is you're going to think it's from a brand or you're going to think it's from a person it isn't. So the way to break that chain is go directly to the brand yourself through your browser or talk directly to the person you think it is through another channel like Slack or the phone. You know, go outside of email, right? To do the transaction. So I think that's, I think that's really good advice. But, but talk for a minute now, like what, where are we going? Like, like I can send you a letter in the US post office mail and there's federal laws. If I lie about who I am or I try to defraud you and stuff like that yeah. on the internet, you know, nobody seems to care. So, so take Facebook, take Slack, take texting. What's the future of collaboration and, and email? And, and, and can we do this in a free and open society without demanding maybe a national ID system? Yeah, I think there's two really different outcomes here. One is kind of what you've talked about in the past, which is, hey, like when people do horribly malfeasant things around financial transactions, like they go to jail, right? Um, or at least they're going to get some stiff penalty. When the same thing happens in cyber, it's kind of like, eh. You know, I look at the outcomes of some of the companies that have been most high breach, high profile, some of their stock prices are higher than the day before they announced their breach. So, so one outcome is until people have real consequences, they won't actually care about fixing this stuff in general. Now there will be people who do care and they will work diligently on it, but, but the majority necessarily won't. But the other thing that I think I can see because of my unique position as seeing the technology, how it works on anti-phishing, phishing is going to go away as the primary mechanism because people will deploy technologies like Inky and those essentially do solve the problem effectively. They don't perfectly block everything, but they make the efficacy of phishing by the attackers way, way lower. So the attackers will shift to other mechanisms. So in some sense, I guess my answer is the larger cybersecurity challenge of we can take the horse to water, but not make them drink. That's going to be a huge problem until we have some sort of teeth somewhere, as you've said before, to force compliance somehow. Like, so, like PCI kind of does that for credit cards, right? I, I tend to think that we are, you know, we're approaching at a time in, in, in our society where you know, it's socially unacceptable to be against the environment, to be a racist, to be a sexist, to, to, to say that I don't believe in COVID. I think cyber is almost on that list. It's not there yet. I hope that's true. We're getting close. I don't think it's going to take a law. I think it's going to take when it becomes socially unacceptable for cyber, uh, cyber, poor cyber hygiene. You know, I think it's going to go there. I, what concerns me though is, is unless like for the most part, you know, I'm happy with the U.S. government talking about, hey, let's do penalties, let's 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 stop these Russian hackers, let's stop these spammers, crypto. It's all good, good. But without sort of a national ID system, I don't have any way to verify that you're who you are. You know, I invited Dave Baggett onto the Zoom call today over email. I've met you. I might be a deep fake. <laughs> yeah, you, this could be all a deep fake, right? So the question is, is until you actually have that at the core of what you're doing. It's kind of hard to build these systems up and we're always going to have maneuver room for people to kind of get in between that and pretend to be mom or pretend to be, you know, the, the, the son who's looking for money to get bailed out of jail. Yeah. And I By think the way, what that's you're... your son or my son, that hasn't happened yet. So, I mean, I think what you're, what you're addressing is the lack of true, strong authentication in these communication protocols. And, and one of the things that is very frustrating about email is DKIM is kind of strong authentication for branded mail, provided you know the domain. Because the DKIM digital signature proves the mail came from mail server example.com. And so that's a strong authentication, at least of the fact that the mail came from this server. We don't know who runs that server. Presumably, if it's Microsoft.com, we can make assumptions about it. If it's MS SysUpdate, not so much. At least that's something. But for mail from people, there's nothing. Yep, and and there's, and there's a lot of stuff that we do that we pay somebody else to send our mail, right? Uh, yep. You know, we might. This is this a a real survey monkey? 
it was it or is it somebody pretending to be a survey monkey for for company xyz so that's 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 interesting well, so i would so i would i would emphasize what you said i would actually underscore yes there needs to be something like a national id but it also needs to be combined with digital signatures that are used ubiquitously to sign and are arguably encrypt communications right like the s mime standard was finalized in 1999 it has the concept of using a private key to sign mail so that then you, the recipient, can prove it definitely came from somebody who knows that key. So if it's only in my phone, you can assume it's probably me, right? You can prove it wasn't tampered with in transit, so nobody changed it after I sent it, right? And if you use a public-private key combination, asymmetric cryptography, I can encrypt it for you so that only you can decrypt it because only you have your private key. Which means Google can't read it. <laughs> No one in the media, no one in the middle can read it. And, and this stuff's all there. It's just impossible to use. And I think the larger tech players don't want to embrace it because I think as you, as you sort of alluded to, well, then how do we add value if we can't read all your communications? Like that's just going to have to go away, right? Like we're not going to be able to have intermediaries arbitrarily able to read all of our communications. That's just completely insane, right? So I, I always like to talk about science fiction as a close for this show. And we were talking about something that you like and so a show that I really enjoy is The Expanse. Yeah. If you haven't seen this show, communication is ubiquitous, right? You call me, I literally get a picture of you, holograph. Uh, sometimes if you're behind Jupiter, maybe you have to wait till you're in shot to, to get that message. Right. To you. C can you imagine such a system that has that kind of availability across a solar system? No, because I think there's a, <laughs> well, there, well, there's a, I mean, this is the problem with a lot of science fiction, which is sort of depressing. You have this fundamental speed of light barrier, right? If you look at even multiplayer games, if you're playing a multiplayer game with somebody in Korea, the speed of light is a factor. The latency of just traversing planet earth is relevant for the design of the game and it's relevant to control schemes. So now imagine solar system levels you're going to have lag of eight minutes to get to the sun, right? There's no getting around that unless the speed of light isn't really the speed limit. And it sure seems like there's 120 years of evidence. It's kind of the speed limit, <laughs> you know? So I can't imagine that. It is really cool to see. The other thing I like about the show, though, which absolutely will happen, I think, is you notice how they've taken the Apple design aesthetic vastly into the future everything's like super thin and like clear and visible and like that's clearly what johnny ive would do now if he could <laughs> right so so i think that's all all that material science stuff that makes it have better display technology i was looking at this site these guys looking glass that have a holographic display i mean it's super primitive compared to what you see in science fiction but it's kind of the same idea i think the communication latency stuff's going to be a real a real challenge for expansion into the solar system and beyond. I just don't know how do you effectively communicate when it takes a month for light to get from you to the destination. Some of the basic things in Expanse that I really like is, you know, I might be on my, I'm not gonna say phone, but my communications device, and I'll just kind of go like that. And it'll 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 automatically go right. onto the TV. And I'm like, oh my God, like is that airplay? Is it are they on the right Wi-Fi? Right? Are they guest Wi-Fi? I hope the VLAN is is actually pretty good. And uh, why? I hope I wasn't watching pornography on that before. <laughs> right. Like, well, this idea of those pervasive things, computing so too. instantaneous, you know. Yeah, this idea of pervasive computing—that's going to happen where every surface will be, you know, at least computational. You'll have every you know, the difference. The distinction between walls and displays will go away. I think that's all going to happen. Um, the other thing I love about that show, honestly, and it came from the books, um, the language that the belters use is very interesting and they worked with linguists on this. But I think that that, it's always hard in science fiction to have, you wanna have some of the words that people don't know because it's the future and there's this new vocabulary, but then it always sounds kind of ridiculous and phony. I think that's one of the few shows where they've done a really good job of getting it exactly right. Like it seems totally believable that there's this belter argot that they speak and you can kind of learn to understand it too.
Yeah, what I like about about that is, you know, so people who haven't watched the show, there's you got the Earth, uh, you got the Martians, which are people from Earth that live on Mars. They just been there a while, separate separate nation, if you will, separate planet. And then you have the Belters who live in the asteroid. And so if you grow up in space, born in space, work in space, you're a pretty tall, lanky dude or woman. Right. <laughs> and and they've got pretty much tall, lanky dudes and women, yeah. you know, uh, who speak this weird accent while they're walking around on their magnetic boots, you know, click, click, click. And and just the, yeah, the only criticism I have for the show from a physics point of view is, you know, there's no sound in space and it would be kind of boring to see these like ships barreling down right. and launching yeah, yeah. missiles and trying to shoot them down without that kind of cool, you know, THX sound effect. But for the most part, it's pretty badass from a physics point of view. Yeah, I think anybody who likes science fiction has to watch the show. And I'm really, I'm disappointed that it sounds like season six is the last one. I'm hoping, I'm hoping Bezos bails them out again and <laughs> funds them Maybe for another 10 gonna, seasons. You know, <laughs> he'll just, he's just doing expanse on his own, his own rocket. Right. <laughs> what, what other kind of science fiction do you enjoy or do you think help guides your, you know, what you're doing at Inky? I mean, I don't know about, inky per se but i do think that you know some of the more there's things like black mirror that are that are just near enough future yes they're sort of extreme takes on the near enough future and some of it's not realistic but some of it really is kind of plausible near future that's pretty compelling and also makes you sort of think about the implications of technology broadly so i i like that stuff and I, of course, like a lot of other nerds grew up watching Star Trek. So even though Star Trek is kind of ridiculous in a lot of ways, it still sort of warms my heart. <laughs> There's a certain a utopian of... dream behind Roddenberry's stuff that I think is kind of at times funny because it's cheesy, but also sometimes it kind of hits the mark and is, and is compelling. Definitely a commentary on, more of a commentary on our social and technological status than maybe even things like Black Mirror. Right, and I remember still watching that stuff when I was seven, it was a lot easier to just think, oh yeah, they're on this planet and it's exactly like World War II Earth and that makes sense. And <laughs> now I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't believe that. I wouldn't be able to suspend my disbelief, but as a kid, it was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. I get it. <laughs> That's excellent. So Dave, where, where can people find you? Do you speak at conferences? Do you have, do you have a LinkedIn profile? Yeah, I have a LinkedIn profile. I put, on, put things on there pretty often inky.com we have a lot of material both me presenting like video but also just reports on some of these kinds of tactics that if people want to get educated on what's really going on out there what the smart walter white type fishing actors are doing then that's a great resource we put a lot of effort into really documenting what we've found in terms of these tactics and trying to publish it and also we talk a little bit about like how do we how do we develop countermeasures to the tactics, right? So that's on Inky.com. Uh, and then I've, I, you know, years ago, I, I wrote a lot of answers on Quora. So Quora is kind of becoming a kind of a bizarre, a bizarre place now. But in the 2013 era, I wrote a lot of stuff on there about Crash Bandicoot and some of the other stuff I'd done before. So that's another place you can find me. Awesome. Well, Dave, thanks so much for keeping our uh, corporate inboxes free of spam, phishing, and uh, business compromise email. And so, ransomware. Uh, and ransomware. <laughs> well, it just never goes. Like, uh, yeah. Right. And, and unwanted Viagra shipments, right? Um, right. So, Dave, thank you very much. This is Ron Gula signing out with another episode of Gula Tech Cyber Fiction.